the last few weeks leading into this Easter celebration, we've been talking about stories of people in the scriptures who get it wrong, and then upon getting it wrong, really double down into getting it wrong. A lot of times their mistake was sin, and their sin caught up to them. And when their sin caught up to them, rather than returning to God and finding that there was freedom and forgiveness from God, instead, they just doubled down into self-destruction. We've told the story about Samson, the judge in ancient Israel, who every time he was caught, he responded with violence and anger against his uh, enemies until finally he was caught and his eyes were gouged out. And instead of seeking forgiveness and restoration then, he tore down the temple of, of his enemies and even brought himself to death. We talked about Jonah, who was called by God to go and speak to Nineveh, but he didn't want to. He didn't want to see his enemies redeemed, and so he ran. And in running, he eventually found himself in the belly of a whale trying to escape God. But God found him there, sent him to Nineveh. When he got to Nineveh, he preached a pretty mediocre sermon, and the whole city was redeemed anyways. And then he went and had a standoff with God outside of the city. We told the story of Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus. And in spite of the fact that everyone who made a mistake around Jesus on the way to the cross, Judas himself could not see himself as forgiven. And so he buys a piece of land with the money he earned to betray Jesus and commits suicide there. Last week on Palm Sunday, we talked about how the people nearly had it right but couldn't quite see the repercussions of what they were saying. And so just a few days later, they screamed out, crucify him, after saying, blessed be is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So today in Easter, I, I want to talk about, having led up talking about these stories, I want to talk about how the Easter story gives us the opportunity to be redeemed and to be forgiven. And not so much just from some sort of theological perspective or viewpoint, but very specifically how the risen Lord sought out people who had misunderstandings. He sought out people who had made missteps. And he sought out people who made mistakes. He reached out to them and invited them back into relationship with him. No matter what they had done over the past 24 48, 72 hours, Jesus found his friends and he redeemed them and showed them that there was freedom and forgiveness from the mistakes that they had made. Before we get to the resurrection story, I, I want to pick it up from a story on Good Friday that I told. We're going to walk through the end of the Gospel of John today and eventually I'll read from chapter 20 if you want to follow along. But right before, uh, right before Jesus is resurrected, we're given this story of the burial of Jesus. And the very first person that seems to find some redemption in the uh, Easter story is Nicodemus. Nicodemus we first meet in the third chapter of John. And Nicodemus sneaks under darkness to meet Jesus. He seems to be compelled by what it is that Jesus is preaching and teaching and doing, but yet he had a pretty privileged position as a Pharisee in Israel. And if he was going to decide to be a follower of Jesus, he would risk his insiderness, his power, his prestige, his, uh, his wealth. And so instead he comes in darkness to ask Jesus about what it is that he's doing. And the Gospel of John uh, really, really sort of shows us the way in which darkness can happen, not just in outright sin, but in the way we try to hide who we are as well. And so this is the story where Jesus says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's told to Nicodemus in the darkness of night when Nicodemus wants to meet Jesus. And so uh, Nicodemus has this back and forth and he doesn't seem ready to believe because we're just left with the words of Jesus where Jesus tells him whoever lives by the truth comes into light so that it may be seen plainly what they have done and has been done in the sight of God. And then Nicodemus disappears. We see him briefly one other time and then he shows up at the cross. When Jesus dies, 
He helps Joseph of Arimathea, a, a wealthy patron who has a tomb that can be borrowed by Jesus because he does not have enough money to own his own tomb. And so Nicodemus reaches up onto the cross and helps Joseph take this dead body of Jesus off the cross. Now, as a Pharisee, Nicodemus would have been preparing to have the Passover meal, to have the Sabbath of the Passover. But he risks his ability to celebrate the Passover, the key story of the Jews, because he makes himself profane by touching a dead body. You can't now participate in the Passover you can't now participate in the Sabbath when you have touched a dead body, according to Jewish law. He is making an incredible act of faith to make himself unclean because he comes out in public to show his faith in the one who is Jesus Christ. This is before the resurrection. What an incredible act of faith that Nicodemus makes. But that's just the first story of redemption. The rest of the stories of redemption aren't so wild. Most of them are a little more peculiar in that they're sad because the people don't know what to do. They don't know what to do with their mistake. But Jesus comes to them. We're going to read the story in uh, chapter 20 of the resurrection in that morning scene. We're just going to read the first nine verses together in John chapter 20. And I invite you, if you would, would you join me in standing as we read the word of the Lord today? Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. We don't know where they have put him. These are Jesus' closest followers. It's hard to believe that they missed a single sermon recorded in the scripture. They've had nighttime campfire devotionals and talks. They've had insider conversations. Everything that seems plain to us when we read the scripture today had been confided in them one-on-one. -on -one. And yet they're still confused. Mary says, we don't know where they have put them. We're told a few details in this story, all of them uh, kind of funny if you know how the story goes. The first is, for some reason, John, the author of this gospel, wants you to know that he is faster than Peter. <laughs> to this day, I'm still not real sure why that's necessary, but I do think that it should be a life goal of mine to write some sort of book that's timeless where I get to throw shade at the people that I love. Really, really uh, lightly, you know? Like I may want to mention how I always beat my wife in card games. Something like that. So, uh, yeah, I like that. Something, something that'll last forever where everyone knows, yeah, I was pretty good at that. What a strange thing for him to say. But they get there, and John won't go in the tomb. He waits for his slow friend. Peter walks in, barges in, seems consistent with his personality, if you really think about it. And he goes in, and he sees that the cloths and the linens are laid there. And then we're told 
that John walks in after Peter and sees the same thing. And there's this just incredibly peculiar ending to the resurrection, the empty tomb story. John walks in and it says, he saw and he believed. But he still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus was to rise from the dead, which should beg the question, what did he believe? What did he believe? Because it seems to me what he should have believed is Jesus said, I am going to raise from the dead. In three, they will kill this temple and in three days I will rise again. That should be what John believes. There's an empty tomb. He knew Jesus was there just about three days ago. Now he's not. He told us all along he was going to raise from the dead. He's not here. That's what I believe. But it kind of seems quite the opposite of that. But here's the thing that I think is so helpful and hopeful in this text is that it seems to me that belief does not demand systematic, complete understanding. You don't have to have all your facts in a row. You don't have to be able to wrap your mind around it. You don't have to be able to understand exactly what was fulfilled, exactly why Jesus did this, exactly what is accomplished by the resurrection, you do not have to understand in completeness to believe. You can believe towards understanding. You can believe that it happened, accept it, and then work towards understanding. John comes to understand, but he doesn't yet. But his heart is open to what God might be doing. And at this moment, that seems to be more than enough. And sometimes our mind, especially in our rational state, our, our scientific, trained, mathematical minds where we're told to be able to prove everything, and I get it, but we often want to get to the proofs in order to believe. But sometimes it's okay to believe and then get to understanding along the journey. It seems to be what's happening to John here, and he was an eyewitness of what had happened. But this is just the beginning of this story. I'm going to walk through the end of the Gospel of John uh, pretty quickly from story to story, and I want you to see who Jesus goes and sees and what Jesus, as the risen Lord, does. Because if we want to get an idea of who this risen Jesus is, seeing what he does before he ascends back to heaven is a really good way for us to understand the heart of what Jesus does and who Jesus is on the other side of crucifixion and resurrection. The first person that he talks to is Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of John says that the tomb is in a garden and does so for very particular reasons. But being that it's in a garden, Mary is crying because she legitimately thinks someone has stolen the body of Jesus. She's seen enough bad things in the last week to just assume this is one more bad thing. And it doesn't matter how many lessons she's been told. It doesn't matter how many Sunday school classes she sat through with Jesus himself as the teacher. She just assumes more bad things are happening. And so Jesus appears to her, and she assumes it's a gardener. Now, who knows why? It could be that Jesus presented it as a gardener. It could be that her tears were so overwhelming that she couldn't see straight. There are so many reasons it could be, but she begins to beg this gardener to please show her where the body of her Lord is. And she does not recognize him until he calls her by name, which is a powerful moment. He just simply says, Mary. And when the particularity, the familiarity of her name being called by her Lord, she realizes that it is him, that he is alive. And she runs and hugs him so hard that he warns her, like, I've got to go back to God. Don't hold on too tight. But she goes and tells everyone, I have seen the Lord. Now this scene is a scene that's meant for us to see that Jesus is undoing the story of the Garden of Eden. 
The Garden of Eden is how the Bible begins, that Adam and Eve lived in the garden. Eve is uh, tricked by the serpent, tricks then uh, Adam into eating the apple. Then they both fall and are kicked out of the garden. Jesus is a gardener in this story because we are to see that he's undoing the curse of the garden. And in undoing the curse of the garden, his first task is to not get on Mary for not seeing him, but instead he reveals himself to her in familiarity so that she can see. Jesus is restoring all things already. From there, he goes to the disciples who are afraid. They've seen enough in the last week, so they are locking themselves behind doors because they're afraid, hey, man, if Jesus can get killed, so can we. So they lock themselves behind doors, and Jesus appears to them inside of the room where they're meeting. Jesus walks in, and the first thing he does is he offers peace to them. What an incredible gift that must have been. Because if you're scared enough of the local authorities that you're in an anonymous room behind locked doors, the last thing in your heart is peace. You have conflict and fear and concern. And Jesus comes in and the gift he offers them is peace. Now at this point, they hadn't quite understood that Jesus had risen from the dead. Mary had shared them a story that they had seen him, but they were now wanting to see for themselves. They were still dominated by the fear of Friday and not yet set free by the news of Sunday. And once they receive peace and they trust that Jesus is there and resurrected, Jesus then gives them the ministry of sin forgiveness. Once peace comes into their hearts, he tells them their sins are forgiven and they have the power to go and tell the world that their sins are forgiven. And if they go and tell people their sins are forgiven, their sins are indeed forgiven. And if they keep that gift for themselves, if they don't go and tell others that their sins are forgiven, then those people will not receive the gift of sin forgiveness. Jesus appears to the disciples and gives them peace, gives them forgiveness, and then gives them the gift of offering forgiveness to others. Now you may know that There were only 10 disciples in the room that day. Judas had already uh, decided that he was going to kill himself because he had betrayed Jesus. For whatever reason, Thomas is not there that day. And so all of Thomas's buddies, the disciples, go and find him. And they're like, hey man, we've seen Jesus. He's alive. And poor Thomas gets hung with one of the most unfortunate nicknames in history. Doubting Thomas, because Thomas does what most all of us would have done if it were us. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you saw, you saw the guy I saw dead, huh? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, he walked into a locked room. Yeah, okay, got it. Why exactly are you trying to prank me? He says, I tell you what, you know what, I'll believe your story when I can put my finger in his side and through the holes in his hands. Ooh, those are words that would come back to haunt Thomas for some 2,000 years. Because the next week, they gathered together to pray again. And I find it interesting that in spite of the fact that Jesus is risen from the dead, they still lock the doors behind themselves. Jesus can defeat the grave, but they're still afraid of the Jews. They lock the doors behind them, and Jesus shows up again and finds Thomas and says, Hey, Thomas, I heard what you said about me. And he shows him his hands and his sides, and Thomas puts his fingers in, and he says, My Lord and my God. He he has faith when he sees and when he touches. And and this is a moment that I, I, I long for, I identify with, is to be able to actually physically see and touch The Lord who was risen must have been a shot of confidence in Thomas's life. But Jesus identifies in this moment very quickly, you and I. He sees us because he says, you have believed because you have seen. Blessed are those who do not get a chance like this. And yet they still believe. Listen, I would rather be Thomas than me in this story. But I appreciate the gift that Thomas has given me. 
that there are those with the testimony of having seen who have said and done what I think I would have said and done on that moment on that day, who then opened the door of belief for someone like me 2,000 years later. Blessed are those who do not see, who do not touch, who do not have the opportunity to see the hole in the side and put their finger there and yet still believe. Jesus is restoring those who doubt as well. And the story, of course, is not over. Most of chapter 21 has to do with the redemption of Peter. Now, Peter walked into the empty tomb, but you may recall that a pretty famous part of the story of Jesus' crucifixion is that Peter was given three times to testify that he knew who Jesus was. A simple testimony, really. Not, uh, not something that was punishable by death, though Peter might have been afraid that it was, but just, hey, you were with him. We saw you with him. You are one of his disciples. And after Jesus predicted that he would deny him three times, and Peter just, well, absolutely. Now, I would never do such a thing. If I have to go to death with you, I will die next to you. But then when the rubber meets the road, people point Peter out, and Peter says, I've never known that guy. I've never met him. I don't know him. And so though, even though Peter goes to the empty tomb, there's unfinished business. Because this mistake, this denial, was costly. Not only costly in some cosmic sense, but surely in Peter's own heart. Could I possibly be useful if when the stress of following Jesus comes upon me just a little bit, I skirt and I hide and I run and I'm scared. But Jesus comes to Peter and he redeems him. He forgives him. He gives him the ministry that Peter would walk onto as an apostle telling the world about what Jesus had done. And in doing so, Peter asks him three times in order to undo the three times that he had denied him. Do you love me? Yes, you know I do. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes, you know I do. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes, you know I do. Feed my lambs. His mistake is undone. His testimony has been changed. And Jesus redeems him and sets him free. Jesus is now the risen Lord. He's been crucified. He's bled on our behalf. He's died. He was put in a tomb and laid there for three days. When the tomb is empty... What do they expect? The disciples, the women, what do they expect? That's a question we could spend a lot of time pondering on. But what they end up seeing is something very different than what they clearly expect. There's something about the way our mind is programmed that we're prepared for a retributive victory lap from the Jesus that we've left to die alone. But this is not the Jesus that we come to meet at all. There's a sense that they all know Jesus. They've spent a life following Jesus. They've done everything right. They've said all of the right things, and yet they're so close to missing it. They've seen all of the forgiveness. They've heard all of the sermons. They've seen all the restoration. They've witnessed all of the miracles. And yet still, as close as they are to Jesus, there seems to be this overwhelming fear and misunderstanding, even in the moment of a post-Easter world. Christ has made all things new. He's overcome and defeated death. And they're still just a little bit afraid that they're going to be condemned for what they have done that their sin, their missteps, their mistakes are going to overwhelm who Jesus is. But instead, their experience with the risen Lord is something radically and incredibly different. They have a very, very different experience than Je with Jesus than what they're afraid they might have. Because the stories we've read today go like this. There's a Pharisee who confronts Jesus in darkness but yet handles his crucified body in the light. There's an emotional Mary who can't see Jesus through her tears of grief. 
We have a disciple who believes before he sees. We have a disciple who needs to see before he's willing to believe. And we have an ashamed Peter who is told he's redeemed, loved, and called. You see, the first part of each one of these stories are legitimate barriers to seeing Jesus. Being emotional, being grief-stricken, wanting to believe, being unable to piece together all of the story to make it make sense, having shame, having sin, these are all possible barriers to seeing Jesus. But when Jesus rises from the dead, he does not go on a victory lap. He doesn't show up to people who've wronged him and say to them, I told you so. Why didn't you believe me? Why weren't you listening? Why weren't you there when you had the chance to give a faith testimony? He doesn't do that. He goes to those with these barriers and tears the barriers down and restores them into relationship with God. Maybe today you come sharing some of these barriers. Maybe you've had a rigid religious life that's kept you from experiencing the warmth and the love of Jesus. Maybe today, this year, you're so filled with grief and just assume that joy isn't for you. Perhaps you're the type that demands evidence because belief is hard to come by. Or even you're feeling as though your past, the things you've done, the ledger that you're very aware of is disqualifying. But I want you to know today that the story of the resurrection of Jesus and his behavior and his actions and his time with people show us that the resurrection very specifically means reconciliation with God for you, for me. It doesn't matter what barriers you have in your life. Jesus tore it down when he walked out of the grave on Sunday morning. The way is open for you to know God and for God to know you. And we're going to celebrate this particularly in people's lives today. We have three baptisms in this service. We'll have another one in the 11 o'clock service as well. And I want to remind you about what the joy of baptism is. Baptism is very particularly the reenactment of the Easter story in our own life, that we have died with Christ. Being put under the water is a reenactment of the burial of Christ. And then the coming up out of the water is the reenactment of the resurrection and life again. I I don't want to get too scary or anything, but if the pastor put you under water and left you there, you would eventually die. But we're always lifted up and we're made new, and we're made clean, and we're initiated into the family of God. And we find in that moment that we now live a new life given to us in Christ. Our old life, our sin, our history, our past, our story is washed away. And we are made new. We are a child of God and a member of his church in this world when we are baptized. And so today, um, first of all, we have Pastor Gretchen coming with two kids, and she's going to do the first two baptisms. And I want to remind you that as she's coming, that this is a celebration. This is as big as it gets in the church. And so when the testimony is shared, and then Pastor Gretchen uh, takes the children and drops them down into the water and lifts them back up, when they emerge from the water, I want you all to celebrate like a touchdown has been scored to win the Super Bowl, okay? This This is exciting stuff. And this is the best part of the church.